I'm Ellen Eisman, a longtime member of the library's board. I have the great pleasure tonight to introduce George Packer, one of our country's leading investigative journalists and most accomplished writers. I think I can safely affirm that his discussion of his biography, Our Man, Richard Holbrook at the End of the American Century, will inspire your curiosity about and enhance your understanding of a diplomat who played the most important role on the world stage until his death a decade ago, midway through an assignment working for President Obama. George Packer, while a staff writer for The New Yorker from 2003 to 2018, won Overseas Press Club awards for articles on Iraq and the Civil War in Sierra Leone. Subsequently, his work the Assassin's Gate, America and Iraq, was named one of the 10 best books of 2005 by the New York Times, and also received the New York Public Library's Helen Bernstein Award, and additionally, an overseas press club book award. He's the author of The Village of Waiting about his experience as a Peace Corps volunteer in Africa, and Blood of the Liberals, which garnered the Robert F. Kennedy Book Prize. Mr. Packer has written two novels, is a recipient of the Guggenheim Fellowship, and has taught writing at Bennington, Columbia, and Harvard. His recent book, The Unwinding Inner History of the New America, was a New York Times bestseller and winner of the 2013 National Book Award. That is just a partial overview of his many accomplishments, including the writing of a play, The Trail. On a personal note, when I was very young, I worked for Dick Holbrook at the State Department. He hired me as his special assistant, mostly drafting speeches and congressional testimony. And I stayed in touch with him over the years. Most recently, I ran into him in a restaurant in Midtown here, and he invited my friend and me to join him at his table for dessert. And it's been a long time, he said, expressing sadness at my loss of a husband, leaving me with a young child. It was the naturally warm, empathetic side of Dick on display, not the tough, ambitious, self-centered figure that people <laughs> encounter sometimes <laughs> later. Riveting, a pitch-perfect portrait Norman Perlstein wrote about this biography of Dick Holbrook. Here to tell you more about it and to explain his really remarkable and uh, entertaining work, please welcome George Packer. <laughs> survived really well with the experience of having worked for, for Dick Holbrook when he was a young terror. I think it got easier to work for him uh, as he got older, although never easy. So it's wonderful that you were here to, to introduce me at the closest circle. Sorry, I have the sniffles. I don't have it. <laughs> as far as I know. I don't have it. We all think we have it, but almost none of us do. So we're going to have a healthy and fun evening together. Um, I'm going to read a bit of the prologue so you have a taste, a feel for the book before I talk about it. Then I'll talk about it. And then we'll have time for questions. Holbrook. Yes, I knew him. I can't get his voice out of my head. I still hear it saying, you haven't read that book, you really need to read it. Saying, I feel, and I hope this doesn't sound too self-satisfied, that in a very difficult situation where nobody has the answer, I at least know what the overall questions and moving parts are. Saying, gotta go, Hillary's on the line. <laughs> that voice, calm, nasal, a trace of older New York, a sing-song cadence when he was being playful, but always doing something to you, cajoling, flattering, bullying, seducing, needling, analyzing, one-upping you, applying continuous pressure like a strong underwater current, so that by the end of a conversation, even two minutes on the phone, you found yourself far out from where you started, unsure how you got there, and mysteriously exhausted. <laughs> he was six feet one, but seemed bigger. He had long, skinny limbs and a barrel chest and broad, square shoulder bones, on top of which sat his strangely small head, and encased within it, the sleepless brain. 
His feet were so far from his trunk that as his body wore down and the blood stopped circulating properly, they swelled up and became marbled red and white, like steak. He had special shoes made and carried extra socks in his leather attache case, sweating through half a dozen pairs a day, stripping them off on long flights, and draping them over his seat pocket in first class, <laughs> or else cramming used socks next to the classified documents in his briefcase. He wrote his book about ending the war in Bosnia, the place in history that he always craved, though it was never enough, with his feet planted in a Brookstone Shiatsu foot massager. One morning he showed up late for a meeting in the Secretary of State's suite at the Waldorf Astoria in his stocking feet, shirt untucked and fly half zipped, padding around the room and picking grapes off a fruit basket while Madeleine Albright's furious stare tracked his every move. During a video conference call from the UN mission in New York, his feet were propped up on a chair. While down in the White House Situation Room, their giant distortion completely filled the wall screen <laughs> and so disrupted the meeting that President Clinton's National Security Advisor finally ordered a military aide to turn off the video feed. <laughs> Holbrook put his feet up anywhere, in the White House, on other people's desks and coffee tables, for relief and for advantage. Near the end, it seemed as if all his troubles were collecting in his feet. Atrial fibrillation, marital tension, thwarted ambition, conspiring colleagues, hundreds of thousands of air miles, corrupt foreign leaders, a war that would not yield to the relentless force of his will. But at the other extreme from his feet, the ice blue eyes were on perpetual alert. Their light told you that his intelligence was always awake and working. They captured nearly everything and gave almost nothing away. <clears throat> like one-way mirrors, they looked outward, not inward. I never knew anyone quicker to size up a room, an adversary, a newspaper article, a set of variables in a complex situation, even his own imminent death. The ceaseless appraising told of a manic spirit churning somewhere within the low voice and languid limbs. Once in the 1980s, he was walking down Madison Avenue when an acquaintance passed him and called out, Hi, Dick. Holbrook watched the man go by, then turned to his companion. I wonder what he meant by that. <laughs> <laughs> yes, his curly hair never obeyed the comb, and his suit always looked rumpled, and he couldn't stay off the phone or TV, and he kept losing things, and he ate as much food as fast as he could once slicing open the tip of his nose on a clamshell and bleeding through a pair of cloth napkins. Yes, he was in almost every way a disorderly presence, but his eyes never lost focus. So much thought, so little inwardness. He could not be alone. He might have had to think about himself. Maybe that was something he couldn't afford to do. Leslie Gell, Holbrook's friend of 45 years and recipient of multiple daily phone calls, would butt into a monologue and ask, what's Obama like? Holbrook would give a brilliant analysis of the president. How do you think you affect Obama? Holbrook had nothing to say. Where did it come from, that blind spot behind his eyes that masked his inner life? It was a great advantage over the rest of us because the propulsion from idea to action was never broken by self-scrutiny. It was also a great vulnerability. And finally, it was fatal. I can hear the voice saying, it's your problem now, not mine. He loved speed. Franz Klammer's fearless downhill run for the gold in 1976 was a feat Holbrook never finished admiring until you almost believed that he had been the one throwing himself into those dangerous turns at Innsbruck. He pedaled his bike straight into a swarming Saigon intersection while talking about the war to a terrified blonde journalist just arrived from Manhattan. He zipped through Paris traffic while lecturing his State Department boss on the status of the Vietnam peace talks. His Humvee careered down the dirt switchbacks of the Mount Eggman Road above the siege Sarajevo chase by the armored personnel carrier with his doomed 
He loved mischief. It made him endless fun to be with and got him into unnecessary trouble. In 1967, he was standing outside Robert McNamara's office on the second floor of the Pentagon, a 26-year-old junior official hoping to catch the Secretary of Defense on his way in or out for no reason other than self-advancement. A famous colonel was waiting, too, a decorated paratrooper back from Vietnam where Holbrook had known him. Everything about the colonel was pressed and creased, his uniform shirt, his face, his pants carefully tucked into his boots and delicately bloused around the calves. He must have spent the whole morning on them. That looks really beautiful, Holbrook said, and he reached down and yanked a pants leg all the way out of its boot. <laughs> the colonel started yelling. Holbrook laughed. Back in the Kennedy and Johnson years, when he was elbowing his way into public life, the phrase action intellectuals was hot, until Vietnam caught up with it and intellectuals got burned. But that was Holbrook. Ideas mattered to him, but never for their own sake. Only if they produced solutions to problems. The only problems worth his time were the biggest, hardest ones. Three fiendish wars, that's what his career came down to. He was almost singular in his eagerness to keep risking it. Having solved Bosnia, he wanted Cyprus, Kosovo, Congo, the Horn of Africa, Tibet, Iran, India, Pakistan, and finally Afghanistan. Only the Middle East couldn't tempt him. As the Washington bureaucracy got more ca cautious, his appetite for conquest grew. Right after his death, Hillary Clinton said, I picture him like Gulliver, tied down by Lilliputians. <laughs> he loved history so much that he wanted to make it. The phrase great man now sounds anachronistic, but as an inspiration for human striving, maybe we shouldn't throw out the whole idea. He came of age when there was still a place for it, and that place could only be filled by an American. This was just after the war, when the ruined world lay prone and open to the visionary action of figures like Atchison, Kennan, Marshall, and Harriman. They didn't just grab for land and gold like the great men of earlier empires. They built the structures of international order that would endure for three generations longer than anything ever lasts, and that are only now turning to rubble. These were unsentimental, supremely self-assured, white Protestant men, privileged, you could say, born around the turn of the century, who all knew one another and knew how to get things done. They didn't take a piss without a strategy. Holbrook revered them all and adopted a few as replacement fathers. <coughs> He wanted to join them at the top, and he clawed his way up the slope of an establishment that was crumbling under his crampons. He reached the highest base camp possible, but every assault on the summit failed. He loved books about mountaineers, and in his teens, he climbed the Swiss Alps. He was a romantic. He never realized that he had come too late. You will have heard that he was a monstrous egotist. It's true. It's even worse than you've heard. <laughs> I'll explain as we go on. He offended countless people, and they didn't forget. And since so many of them swallowed their hurt, it was usually the first thing out of their mouth that his name came up as in the How he once told a colleague, I lost more money in the market today than you make in a year. <laughs> How he bumped an elderly survivor couple from the official American bus to Auschwitz on the 50th anniversary of its liberation, added himself to the delegation alongside Elie Wiesel and left the weeping couple to beg Polish guards to let them into the camp so they wouldn't miss the ceremony. How he lobbied for the Nobel Peace Prize, that kind of thing, all the time, as if he needed to discharge a surplus of self every few hours to maintain his equilibrium. <laughs> And the price he paid was very high. He destroyed his first marriage and his closest friendship. His defects of character cost him his dream job as Secretary of State, the position for which his strengths of character eminently qualified him. You can't untangle these things. I used to think that if Holbrook could just be fixed, a dose of self-restraint, a flash of inward light, he could have done anything. But that's an illusion. We are wholly ourselves. 
if you cut out the destructive element, you would kill the thing that made him almost great. As a member of the class of lesser beings who aspire to a good life, but not a great one, who find the very notion both daunting and distasteful, I can barely fathom the agony of that almost. Think about it. The nonstop schedule, the calculation of every dinner table, the brain that burned all day and night, and the knowledge buried so deep he might have only sensed it as a physical aid that he had come up short of his own impossible exaltation. I admired him for that readiness to suffer. His life was full of pleasures, but I never envied it. I'm trying to think what to tell you now that you have me talking. There's too much to say, and it all comes crowding in at once. His ambition, his loyalty, his cruelty, his fragility, his betrayals, his wounds, his wives, his girlfriends, his sons, his lunches. By dying, he stood up a hundred people, including me. He could not be alone. If you're still interested, I can tell you what I know from the beginning. I wasn't one of his close friends, but over the years I made a study of him. You ask why? Not because he was extraordinary, though he was, and might have rivaled the record of his heroes if he and America had been in their prime together. Not because he was fascinating, though he was, and right this minute, somewhere in the world, 14 people are talking about him. <laughs> I won't relate this story for his sake. No, we want to see and feel what happened to America during Holbrook's life, and we can see and feel more clearly by following someone who was almost great. Because his quest leads us deeper down the alleyways of power than the usual famous subjects, whom he knew, all of them. And his boisterous struggling lays open more human truths than the composed annals of the great. This was what Les Gelb must have meant when he said just after his friend's death, far better to write a novel about Richard Holbrook than a biography, let alone an obituary. What's called the American century was really just a little more than half a century. And that was the span of Holbrook's life. It began with the Second World War and the creative burst that followed. The United Nations, the Atlantic Alliance, containment, the free world. And it went through dizzying lows and highs until it expired the day before yesterday. The thing that brings on doom to great powers and great men is it simple hubris or decadence and squander, a kind of inattention, loss of faith, or just the passage of years? At some point, that thing set in, and so we're talking about an age gone by. It wasn't a golden age. There was plenty of folly and wrong, but I already miss it. The best about us was inseparable from the worst. Our feeling that we could do anything gave us the Marshall Plan and Vietnam, the peace at Dayton, and the endless Afghan war. Our confidence and energy, our reach and grasp, our excess and blindness, they were not so different from Holbrook's. He was our man. That's the reason to tell you this story. That's why I can't get his voice out of my head. That's the prologue. So. <laughs> He died in December of 2010. And within a month, his widow, Kati Martin, who's a writer as well, gave me his personal papers, which were in these filing cabinets. Um, and so by January, the end of January 2011, they were making their way across the East River in a moving truck to my small home office in Brooklyn, where they so crowded the room that I couldn't get the door all the way open. <laughs> um, and for seven years they sat there, kind of burdening me, watching me. It felt as if Holbrook himself was in my room, <laughs> staring me down all the time and saying, what are you doing with my papers? And what the hell is taking you so long? Well, 
what was in those papers was a remarkable, disorganized mess, as you can imagine from the way I described him, but a truly remarkable set of documents that included letters to his first wife from South Vietnam in the early 60s, diaries from Bosnia and from Afghanistan, scraps of hotel stationery, airline stationery on which he wrote frantic thoughts uh, for whatever reason of his own. In other words, a, a kind of not, not exactly complete and, and thorough and, and systematic, but the record of a life lived in public, unlike almost any I know of. And so I had the great privilege of possessing those papers. <coughs> but I have to tell you that it really did feel more like a pain than a privilege for a long time. And the reason was I did not know how to write the book. I've, not, I've never written a biography. I'm not a biographer. I find a lot of biographies a little boring because the biographer has decided to include every damn detail of the subject's life, which is why they're all 900 pages long. <laughs> I instinctively knew that I could not write a book like that about Richard Holbrook. First, the world was not waiting for this book. His reputation was already beginning to fade within a couple of years of his death, because that is the way it goes with history. Very few people survive and get bigger as time goes on. Holbrook was very big when he was alive. You felt people forgetting him after he died. Um, and I also didn't want to do it. Why would I subject myself and the reader to a, an ordeal of a book? And it would be finally unjust to him. It would be untrue to him, because he was anything but boring anything but stayed. I had to find a way to write about him that could, in some ways, match him. And it came to me one day, mystically, very unusual for me, when I was driving in Connecticut, and I heard a voice in my head that said, Holbrook? <laughs> yes, I knew him. And I sat up behind the steering wheel and felt, almost felt my heartbeat quickening, because I thought, that what is that voice? Who's talking? I don't know, but all I know is I'm excited by that. That interests me. I could see writing a book that way. Namely, not as a neutral, detached, know-it-all biographer, but as a person who somehow knew the story. And you never find out how this person knew the story. Throughout the book, I don't talk about all the interviews I did. There were 250 of them or about all the research I did, it's there and in other places too. Instead, it's written like a yarn, like a novel. And you have asked the question, did you know Holbrook, that has prompted this yarn. The yarn is 550 pages long, so it's like a very long night with maybe a lot of drinking, <laughs> but it is a yarn. I I'm telling you a story and I'm speaking directly to you as the reader, I'm breaking that fourth wall so that there's a kind of intimacy between me and the reader. And who is speaking? I have to say, it's not me. That voice you just heard is a kind of mishmash of the mainly older men who I spent many hours, lucky hours, with hearing about Holbrook, the guys who knew him best. They were older than me, but they were also wiser than me, more seasoned more in command of facts and of insight into him. And so I kind of borrowed their authority with that voice so that it seems like the voice of someone who just has known Holbrook and knew the story all along. It's the only invention in the book. There's 30 pages of notes for anyone who wants to make sure I did my homework. This is a work of strict nonfiction, but there is one invention and it's the narrator's, narrator's voice. And I think it's the key to the book because it's what turns this from a static biography of facts to uh, a book that brings someone to life on the page. And that was the essential thing with Holbrook, to bring him to life, because he demanded a book like that. He was larger than life, and that doesn't even begin to describe him. And let's have a quick look at him. There he is, late in life. Everything he did had that kind of big gestural quality. Everyone who, who I run into on while I'm promoting this book tells me they have a Holbrook story if they knew it. And it's always something kind of outrageous. 
Um, and it often combines being hurt by him and somehow then being treated kindly by him because he had that capacity to do both of those things. So I felt I needed a narrator who could see Holbrook as he was and who had sort of seen the whole span of history of the book, which starts with Vietnam and ends with Afghanistan, and who has a kind of personal knowledge of America's dreams and defeats and battles with itself so that the narrator could fully evoke Holbrook as the agent of those dreams and battles, embodying the spirit of a whole era. That's the project of the book. Not just to give you Holbrook, but to give you this era that he lived in. So let's talk a bit about who he was and what the era was. He served under every Democratic president from Kennedy to Obama. He started out in the Foreign Service in 1962, and within a year, he was riding a Jeep with a bottle of beer in his hand in the Mekong Delta. Not just in South Vietnam, but he got himself assigned to a rural province in the hottest part of the country during that time, where the war was at its most intense. 1963, the Viet Cong had the countryside by day in the Delta. And Holbrook, at age 22, was the senior American civilian in an entire province. That wouldn't happen today, but that kind of thing happened then, and it happened to him because he didn't hesitate to grab those opportunities, even if he was stepping on somebody's toes. Hillary Clinton told me he was the zealot of American foreign policy because as I followed his story, I found him appearing almost everywhere something interesting was going on. So what more interesting place to begin than Vietnam, 63, when most Americans hadn't even heard of it. Based on the letters that I had from Holbrook to his first wife, I know that within three weeks of arrival, he saw every key thing about the war, because he had that intelligence and that, I would say, intellectual and moral courage to face facts. And the facts were these. Number one, we were losing. No one knew that in 63, except maybe his friends David Halberstam and Neil Sheehan. Mm -hmm. We were losing because we were fighting a conventional war against a guerrilla enemy. We were coming into villages with heavy firepower, backing the South Vietnamese army, and killing a lot of civilians, and turning the survivors into Viet Cong. He saw that right up close. And throughout his life, he, he really needed to see for himself. Unlike a lot of government officials, he didn't trust briefings or intelligence reports, let alone meetings in the White House situation. When he wanted to be there on the ground, see for himself, he actually wanted to be a journalist. That didn't work out for him. The New York Times didn't see the potential. But all his life, he both loved the company of journalists and had a lot of the journalists in himself. The second thing he saw was that we were lying to ourselves. We were sending reports up the chain. And by the time they got from the field to Saigon to Washington, they had been so sterilized and turned into optimistic, happy talk that President Kennedy was essentially getting false accounts of what was going on. And Holbrook knew that too because he was the guy on the ground who knew that there were not 324 secure strategic hamlets in his province, which was what Kennedy was being told. So from the start, he was on the front lines of counterinsurgency on the civilian side, although he also worked with South Vietnamese troops, as you can see in this picture. Um, and he was also keen to what was happening. And that became a lifelong ability to bring a laser intelligence to a particular situation and see clearly. It didn't mean he, was against, he turned against the war. It took four years for him to go from we're losing and we're lying to ourselves to we can't win and we should get out. And that is an interesting lesson in what it is like to be inside the government in the middle of something as big and difficult as a war. You can't allow yourself to give up on it. Instead, you begin to tell yourself 
if only we did this differently, if we use more restrained tactics, if we didn't bring in hundreds of thousands of troops, etc. So he went through all these stages of disillusionment. Finally, in 67, when he went back to Washington, concluding we had to talk, we had to get out, but not just by leaving, we had to talk our way out. And that too was a lifelong idea of his, that you have to talk to your enemy. So he wasn't only being a brilliant young official, he was also networking, schmoozing, working his way up the chain. Here he is schmoozing with Maxwell Taylor on the left on a Saigon tennis court, and a lot of the social life in both Saigon and Washington seemed to take place on the tennis court, because Taylor introduced him to William Westmoreland and then introduced him to Bobby Kennedy back in Washington. So Holbrook was a young man in a hurry, working his way up very quickly, meeting all the right people, um, and making some enemies, because he would trample people who were in his way, or he would ignore people who weren't important enough to him, and he didn't conceal any of that. So he began to be the Holbrook that later became kind of a byword for an asshole in Washington. Um, certainly not only an asshole, but partly an asshole. He came back in 66 and immediately went to work in the Johnson White House, again on counterinsurgency in Vietnam, telling the president to his face that he, Johnson, did not really know what he was talking about when it came to Vietnam. There's Holbrook in the middle looking kind of restrained, but he's actually just gotten finished telling Johnson that uh, his ideas won't work. He went to the Paris Peace Talks as the youngest member of the US delegation under Averill Harriman. Those talks went nowhere. Nixon was elected, and Holbrook left the State Department and had several jobs. He was the country director for the Peace Corps in Morocco. He went to work as the editor of foreign policy. He left his wife and two sons. He became a Washington swinger in the 70s, you can tell. <laughs> um, he made his way through a whole series of girlfriends. One of them was the stepdaughter of Joe Alsop. And one day, they were on a weekend picnic in West Virginia. Both of them were still married, actually. And Holbrook proposed to her. And she got a little rattled and to stall him said, well, tell me how you see yourself in five years. And he said, as the next Henry Kissinger. This young woman knew Henry Kissinger quite well. That was the end of that relationship. <laughs> Holbrook had a lifelong obsession with Kissinger. He, he admired him. He despised him. He considered Kissinger amoral and dishonest. And he also knew that Kissinger was a more brilliant strategist than he. Kissinger, for his part, once called Holbrook the most viperous man I know in this town. <laughs> Which is pretty high praise. <laughs> <laughs> Ellen knows the Holbrook of this picture because here he is as the youngest ever Assistant Secretary of State for East Asia under Jimmy Carter. You'll recognize in the middle of this picture on the Great Wall of China is Vigny Brzezinski who's looking pretty pleased with himself because he's just had Holbrook for breakfast. They were, and Holbrook is looking kind of grim off to the side. They, they were bureaucratic rivals locked in a, a real death match in order to try to secure the negotiations with China for normalizing relations with the US and the People's Republic for their part of the government. Brzezinski for the White House, Holbrook for the State Department. And this story, which was bloody and brutal for Holbrook, for me is a, something that recurs throughout his life, which is government is not polite. Government is not a gentleman's game. It is brutal. There are, it reduces very um, competent and capable people to their worst selves. The struggle for power in a confined space where the only symbols of power are like where your office is or whether you're invited to a meeting at the White House, creates a kind of pettiness and viciousness that is shocking. And it reappeared, and Holbrook was particularly bad or good at that, but it reappeared throughout his life. And so the idea that diplomacy is, you know, a tea party in, in striped suits is, to me, it's not what I found. 
diplomacy is, is, a re, is more like a 15 round boxing match. Um, between gigs in Washington, he worked on Wall Street at Lehman Brothers and other banks. He was never much of a banker. Someone said the only two terms of it, uh, the only two words of investment banking he understood were annual bonus. <laughs> <laughs> but he made money and he made friends uh, among the 0.1% and then he lost money because he spent a lot of money, but really he was always waiting for the next turn of the wheel to get back into government because that was all that ever really mattered to him. That was what he lived for. It was equal parts egotism and idealism. And again, as I say in the prologue, you cannot separate them. They are always together in Richard Holbrook. Just when you are ready to give up on him, he does something thoroughly admirable, like under Carter, fighting hard to get more Southeast Asian refugees admitted to the US. And just when you're beginning to think that he deserves the Nobel Peace Prize, he leaves that survivor couple off the official bus because he took their seat. So it's very hard to have a stable feeling about what we're... The high point of his career came under Jimmy Carter. I mean, under Bill Clinton, excuse me, when he was the Assistant Secretary of State for Europe. Again, these are not the top positions in government. Assistant Secretary, how many Assistant Secretaries of State can you name? But this is as high as Holbrook got, and it was kind of high enough because he always made the most of it. Here he is at Dayton, um, jawboning with Slobodan Milosevic, the dictator of Serbia, during the talks that ended the Bosnian War. And that was really the crown of Holbrook's career. And I honestly think there would not have been a Dayton peace accord without Holbrook because it took someone who had a little bit of the Balkan warlord in himself <laughs> to understand these people, to know how to fight them, to know how to beat them, and he did. It's not a perfect peace by any means, as you can find out if you ever go to Bosnia, but it ended the war, and for that, I think Holbrook deserves a real place in history. His last term in government came under Barack Obama. It did not go well. Look at the body language. Yeah. <laughs> Obama can't look at Holbrook. He's turned 90 degrees toward Biden who not only can look at Holbrook, but seems to be looking daggers. <laughs> Interestingly, Biden and Holbrook were about the, are about the same age and had the same views of every major issue in American foreign policy, and therefore, of course, they couldn't stand each other. <laughs> but the main relationship that went wrong is with Obama. What happened? Obama was no drama. Obama came into office focused on these enormous problems he had inherited, the economy, the wars. The last thing he wanted was to be lectured and flattered by a long-winded, aging diplomat with a legend bringing up his rear. The, the day they met was in Chicago in 2008. Obama had just won the election. He was bringing people to Chicago to interview them for jobs. He didn't have a job for Holbrook. And the people around Obama were Holbrook's enemies. One of them was Anthony Lake, the other was Susan Rice. So Obama, when he knew Holbrook, he didn't like. But he had no choice but to bring him because Holbrook was too good to keep out. Within one minute of their conversation in Chicago, Holbrook made three mistakes. The first was to give Obama a signed copy of his own book on <laughs> You know, it's the kind of thing that self-promoting people do, but with Obama, especially when you don't know him, an instinct should have told Holbrook, you don't do that. He's not gonna be charmed by that. The second thing Holbrook did was to say, Mr. President, could you call me Richard? Not Dick. My wife really prefers for people to call me Richard. So, corrected the new president, and in a way that kind of seemed a little weak. And third, teared up and said, you know, you don't have to be African American to cry. Meaning, I'm so overcome to see our first black president. And again, anyone with an inkling of Obama would know that that, that excessive display of emotion of trying to 
get intimate with him would backfire. And so I think within a minute, Holbrook was a loss. <laughs> he gave him a job because Hillary Clinton, who was Holbrook's one friend in government, and a true friend, they really cared about each other. They were really close to each other. Hillary wanted him at her side. She needed him. And so she insisted, when she became Secretary of State, that Holbrook get the position, which was a kind of thanks a lot job, of ending the war in Afghanistan, or at least conducting the civilian side of that war. Again, very like what he was doing on Vietnam, and a very similar war. And Holbrook knew that right away, and wrote op it saying this will be our longest war, and it's going to be just like Vietnam. And he would go to the Situation Room meetings and pontificate about Vietnam, and Obama would roll his eyes and finally say to the people, who talks like this? <laughs> and Obama told his advisors, I don't want him in the Oval Office. I don't want him in our meetings unless he keeps it short. Obama really had an almost physical reaction to Holbrook. And Holbrook, because he had that inability to see himself that I described in the beginning, did not understand what was wrong, and did everything wrong for a year, until finally he began to realize it just wasn't working, and he tried other things. But for two years, Obama kept him out of meetings, kept him off Air Force One on trips to Afghanistan, <laughs> and, and I would say the way humiliated him, and it's not a wonderful picture of Obama here, but it's also not a wonderful picture of Holbrook. The two were just destined not to meet, and Holbrook had one idea that Obama should have listened to, but Obama didn't want to hear from Holbrook, and that idea was we will never win this war, we can only resolve it by talking to the Taliban, <laughs> and that was what Holbrook tried to do in the last months of his life, and it was what he was doing when he was sitting in Hillary Clinton's office, the office he had always wanted for himself, in December 2010, and she suddenly said, my God, Richard, what's happening to you? What was happening was his face just turned bright red, his aorta had torn, and he was rushed to the hospital. He did not survive. That was the, that was the end of Richard Holbrook, and his, the last hour of his life, which I describe in great detail, he was never more himself than in that last hour. Um, so that's the, the public story of Holbrook. The private story is important. And I spend a lot of time in this book about his relationships with his wives, with his sons, with his girlfriends. His most famous girlfriend was Diane Sawyer. They were together for seven years. The 80s, when she was a rising star in TV news, and he kind of made himself her manager. Um, and exhausted her, and finally someone asked her, when are you going to get married? Holbrook's standing right there, and, this is after, and she said, when the right guy comes along. <laughs> <laughs> Which Holbrook immediately said, ah, she didn't, mean, she didn't mean it, but she did mean it, and the right guy was Mike Nichols, who came along like a month later, and that was the end of Holbrook and Sawyer. He married Kathy Martin, his third wife, who was no mean person in her own right, was in fact every bit his equal. And their marriage was a marriage of partners, of ambition, of love, and of tension. Because two people that big, with that uh, high an ambition, and that fierce an attachment to their own interests, it was never going to be smooth. Um, and that, but it lasted until the end of his life. So there's a lot in the book about those relationships. Holbrook, you know, he wanted everything. He, he read everything. He went to all the movies he could see. He was a star fucker. He hung out with NBA players like Kim Olajuwon and Dikembe Mutombo. He would hang out with the Dalai Lama and poke him in the chest while telling him what's what. He would try to work on scripts with Robert De Niro. You know, he, he had a finger in media, in Hollywood, in Wall Street, in Washington, more than one finger. He just wanted to take on the whole world and swallow it whole. But really, I think he never listened to anyone more carefully than to a refugee in a hot tent in Pakistan, like this man. Because the, the thing that redeems Holbrook, when you've lined up all of his sins, the thing that redeems him is that he really cared. 
He was a rare person who spent his career among powerful people and never lost sight of what mattered, which was making sure that refugees weren't stranded and dying in faraway places that most Americans had never heard of. He never stopped caring, and I think that gives him a claim on our admiration um, more than sheer ambition does. He was ambitious, but he, as his one-time friend Tony Lake said, he was ambitious for what he was doing, not for who he was. Tony Lake is a really important character in the book. They were in the same class of the Foreign Service Institute. They were young stars in Vietnam. They were the rising next generation who all wanted to be the next George Kennan. And, but Lake had an, an advantage on Holbrook. He was a wasp. Holbrook, I have told you this, was Jewish. But he was a Jew who didn't talk about it until he became ambassador to Germany and it became a good career move to talk about it. <laughs> until then, it was kind of a sign of himself. Not that he lied about it or suppressed it. It just didn't, didn't matter to him. Lake and he were very close friends throughout the 60s. They began to drift apart, or at least Lake began to find Holbrook distasteful. And finally, there was a betrayal that I'm not going to tell you about because I want you to read the book, <laughs> but a very personal one that poisoned their friendship in the 70s. And by the 90s, here they are in the 70s with Cyrus Vance, at this point, things are tense between them. But they're not enemies yet. Now they're enemies, and look at Lake's glare as he eyes <laughs> Holbrook, who seems to be kind of coming between him and Bill Clinton. Lake was Clinton's national security advisor, but Holbrook was kind of like Clinton, a big personality. And so in the end, Lake and Holbrook were mortal enemies, and it had a real effect, not just on their personal lives, but on policy in Bosnia, and that's why it's a story that has to be told. Here he is, very near the end of his life. And you can see you know, the whole history of that era in the lines on his face. And I'm gonna end with a bit of his voice. He kept an audio diary at two key moments, Bosnia and Afghanistan. He recorded his thoughts, his activities on a, his little micro cassettes that I found among his papers and that were a great resource, a great treasure. And here he is, three months before his death, um, and you can hear it in his voice. His body is breaking down. But he's not talking about Afghanistan. He's talking about going to the revival of South Pacific at Lincoln Center, which somehow <laughs> was an event that meant as much to him as anything else he was doing. So here is what he has to say, if I could just Yesterday, the 22nd, Katya and I 
the sense, as he says here, that we could do anything and the impulse to do everything. But I really came to understand what this book was about on election night, 2016, when I suddenly realized that that era was over. The Holbrook era was over. We were entering something new, unknown, diminished. <clears throat> And that was when I understood that what I was writing was now history. Thank you very much. You've been very attentive, I can tell. <laughs> that means a lot. So I bet you have some questions. Yes. Did any of his friends suggest that he go into analysis? Huh. <laughs> Kati Martin did. She wanted him in there for three reasons at different times. One, because of his father, who died when Holbrook was 15. And if there is a psychological rosebud of Holbrook's life, it's the loss of his father. Second, this tortured relationship with Tony Lee. And third, their marriage, and an affair she had that nearly ended it. And Holbrook said, I don't do that. I don't, I'm not gonna lie down and tell some stranger what I'm thinking. And I think he probably would have been a terrible patient <laughs> because of that blindness, that inability, and I would say unwillingness to look inward. He could not laugh at himself, which to me is a key sign of whether or not you know yourself and whether or not you can see yourself. He couldn't laugh at himself. I was once walking with him in Georgetown and he was telling me how many journalists had screwed him over. It's kind of a warning to me. Um, and what he said was, you know, they, okay, they call me ambitious, fine, ambition, you know, it all depends on what it's tethered to, it's not a bad thing, but self-promoting, me? <laughs> and I was, that's your whole I mean, what am I doing here? <laughs> um, so that blindness, I think, was, was a tragic quality and it really did hasten the end of his life. Uh, he died, I, I think, in some ways of a broken heart. Um, so maybe the talking cure would have worked, but I doubt it. <laughs> yes, Helen. I just wonder about um, Dick's involvement and uh, interest later on in terms of self-promoting himself too with journalism because when I first met him he was managing editor of foreign policy and he then wrote the book uh, with Clark Clifford as you know and um, he was very involved apparently with Diane Sawyer he would go to her I'm sure you've done this in your notes uh, her uh, recording sessions and give her tips on Tell her about her hair and her, her hair, clothes and, and yell at her yes. producer. And then, yeah. and then he, he tried to, as you just alluded to, uh, manipulate the press and work the press. I just wonder if you talk a little bit about what that all meant, really. Basically, he really liked journalists and thought he knew how to use us, and he, he did. I mean, Barbara's husband, Strobe Talbot, was his first really important journalistic connection, I would say, after Halberstam and she, and when Holbrook was at the Carter State Department and Strobe was the diplomatic correspondent for time, Holbrook was leaking all the time uh, and doing it in a way that advanced his agenda. He always had a, some advocacy, something he wanted to push, but he also was just damn good company. He was fun to be with. I hope I've captured some of that in the book. It's hard to, but that, I think, Journalists liked to hang out with him. John Burns of the New York Times put Holbrook up in his blasted, cold um, little room at the Holiday Inn in Sarajevo in the middle of the siege when Holbrook, as a private citizen, found his way into Sarajevo. And they spent the night talking about the war. And for Holbrook, there was nothing better than that. And he had that romance of, of foreign correspondence, especially, as you know, sort of the both the, the adventurers and the authorities on the subject. And so I think he just enjoyed our company and the feeling was mutual. And it made his colleagues very suspicious of him. And in one moment, Obama pulled him out of a meeting and said, 
you've been leaking, and I don't like it, and I want it to stop. And Holbrooke started to defend himself, and Obama said, I don't want to hear your explanation. And that was, you know, at, at the beginning, things had already gone to that point. So it made him a suspicious figure to government officials, and a, a very interesting figure to journalists. But we also needed to be suspicious of him, because he did manipulate, and he did have an agenda. And he would edit your piece for you. He would tell you how to, what the lead should be. He would, he would say, you don't need that little bit that you've got at the end. You know, and this is before it was published, when you figured out what you were doing. So yeah, it was fun. Yeah. Um, the minute with Obama, that where you brought together the three points, to what extent? Uh, I'm sorry. The minute with Obama, yes, where you, with the three points, to what extent did you draw those three together from disparate sources, or find them in a diary, a letter? Good. That's a great question about my method. So while he was alive, it couldn't have happened after he died, I interviewed him uh, for a profile in the New Yorker. Not a piece that I looked to with a lot of satisfaction, because I now know all the things I did not know when I wrote it, including how bad things were between him and Obama. He told me, off the record, um, what their first encounter was like in Chicago. And the two things he mentioned were the book and the tears. He told it to me as if this meeting had gone incredibly well. <laughs> and that's, that again is that blindness. But I was taking notes and thinking, you said what? <laughs> the third bit about Call Me Richard, not Dick, came from Les Gell, who was probably the most important source for this book, the late Les Gell, unfortunately. Um, and Les was the recipient of so many phone calls from Holbrook. He would leave the meeting with Obama, and before he left the building, get on the phone to Les and tell him how it went. And Les said, how did it go? And Holbrook said, I think it went great. We talked about this, this, and then I said, please call me Richard, not Dick. And then, what the fuck did you say to him? <laughs> and Holbrook said, call me Richard. That's what Kathy prefers. You didn't say that to him. And so Les told me about that one. And that, um, for Les, was a disaster. And I think it was, I know it was a disaster because Obama told other people and it became a story. It's certainly <laughs> kind of a story on homework. So that, those were the sources. But if or when you read the book, as I hope you will, you won't hear that from the narrator. You won't know how, you, you can find it in the notes, but you won't find it in the text because I don't want to break the spell. I want you in the room with Obama not finding out how I got those mm -hmm. details. Mm -hmm. Yes? Um, what prompted the title, Almanac? I was really stuck for a title. Mm -hmm. It was very late. The book was in the publisher's hands. Mm -hmm. They wanted a title. They had a catalog to put out. And I was thinking of Graham Greene and Our Man in Havana, mm -hmm. except that with Holbrook, he was Our Man in Saigon, in Kabul, in Sarajevo. And I finally just kind of cut it off at Our Man, just like a placeholder. I didn't think that could work as a title, but I used, kept it as a, and then told my wife, and she said, I think that works. I said, no, it doesn't. <laughs> and the next morning, I kept thinking about it. And by then, I thought, it does kind of work, because it's, first of all, it's short. And second, it's, it says a lot without saying much. Like, it doesn't point to one thing. It just, it, I think titles are best when they're a little bit poetic and evocative rather than just telling you what to think. And this one, is, for me, evokes he represents something in us, in America, and so he's our man. Yes? I'm going to be reading your book, and I'm not likely to read the subsequent history, uh, but are you under any pressure now to release all of these papers uh, to other historians? Um, Kati Martin gave them to Princeton, and Princeton has them at their manuscript library, and you can go down and read every one of them. None of them have been held back, except his love letters to her, which she gave to me, but didn't want to give to Princeton. Mm -hmm. So she has those now. But yeah, it's all available. Yep. Yeah. Um, 
Yes. So if I understood correctly in the recording, there was some wistfulness about what America had become. Um, was that in essence a commentary he was making on the Obama administration? Yes. I think not just on Obama, but partly. I think he felt that Obama um, was reluctant to put America out front of everything. We know he was. That was. I think Obama saw his job as managing our decline as gracefully as possible. And Holbrook was not the, the kind of person and did not come from the generation that believed we needed to manage our decline. What we needed to do was get back into the lead. That was a fundamental clash of visions. Um, I think in some ways Obama w had his finger on the pulse of history more than Holbrook. By that time, Holbrook was really living in the past to some extent. His diary is full of memories of editing George Kennan and something Abel Harriman said in 1968 and how this thing in Afghanistan reminded him of something he did in the Mekong Delta in 63. So he was as often happens as you get older, he was going deeper and deeper into the past and feeling more and more the sadness of the contrast, but not seeing how and why it happened. And I think one thing he didn't see was that he was part of a class that's called the establishment, a political class, that got us into two wars that we couldn't win. He was pro-Iraq war, pro-Afghanistan, and that also got us into a financial crisis that emptied out the savings of uh, millions of Americans. He owned nine properties that were heavily mortgaged. He was living beyond his means. He was getting sweetheart loans from Angela Mazzillo of Countrywide Financial. He was on the board of AIG. I mean, he was, in some ways, a, a creature of that revolving door of what Trump would call the swamp. And he saw nothing wrong with it. It was kind of his right as a powerful official to then partake once, you know, between terms in office. And I think he did not understand that the American people were not going to keep writing blank checks to that class. So in some ways, his later years are a bit of a harbinger of the populist reaction that we're now living with. Mm -hmm. Yes? How did Cody Martin react to the book? Uh -huh. <laughs> I mean, I was terrified of the answer to that question. Um, I gave her the manuscript before the publisher had begun to, before the concrete was hard, and I wanted her to read it because I owed it to her. She'd given me the papers. There'd be no book without the papers. There were no strings attached to those papers. That was my insistence. But I thought she needs to be able to read it, and if there's something in it that's wrong or unfair, or just whatever she wants to tell me, she has the right to tell me. I'm not necessarily gonna change it, but she has the right. So I, it was a terrifying and, and endless couple of days between when she had it and when I heard from her. And finally I got an email and I gave the phone to my wife and said, I'm not able to read this, you read it. She read it and said, I think you should read it. I said, no, 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 I can't. Just give me the bad news. And she read it to me and it was an incredibly generous response. It was not entirely accepting, it was painful. She cried a lot, she didn't like things in it, she wanted some things taken out. But basically she said, it's your book, and I think it's a great book, and so I, I feel I made the right decision. Mm -hmm. And nothing since then, and that was two years ago, has um, come between us to make me think that she's changed her mind. It was a, not easy for her, because it's not a glowing mm -hmm. and false picture. Any true picture of a life and a marriage is going to be unbearably painful to the subjects. That's my feeling as a writer. She took it as a writer and allowed it to be my book, and so I'm really grateful to her for that. Yes? What was his relationship with his sons? Pretty non-existent for a long time. He was a terrible father. 
He uh, was much more interested in talking to Avril Harriman than in playing basketball with his boys. I think as they got older, he got more interested in them. Um, and in their adult lives, he played a, a role, an important role, but a, an intermittent role. He was absent a lot. Um, his older son, David, made a film about him, The Diplomat, after he died. It's quite a powerful portrait of his father. But it's not a pretty picture of him as a father. Uh, nor is it a pretty picture of Kati as a stepmother. So I, I feel that those boys, um, they got something out of being Richard Holbrook's sons, but on the whole, I wouldn't trade places. Yes? I just wanted a quick sketch of the childhood Yes. Where this yeah. amazing part of my brain came okay from. That's yes. Um, the book goes through it quickly because I honestly didn't think that I could get to somehow the core of the onion by peeling every layer away until I had something essential. Basically, he was who he was. But the details are interesting. Both parents were Jewish refugees. The mother from Hitler's Germany, the father from uh, Stalin's Soviet Union. Um, they met at International House at Columbia in 1940-41. Um, they were classic World War II era refugee immigrants who immediately did everything they could to become Americans. So they stopped talking all the European languages they knew. They didn't talk about Jewishness. They sent the boys to Quaker Sunday School in Scarsdale, uh, which is where they, they grew up. Um, the father was a doctor, and he got colon cancer and had a long illness and finally died when Holbrook was 15. And I think if, you, if there's anything that explains Holbrook psychologically, it's that the man whose opinion mattered most to him, whose approval he needed most, was gone for most of his life. The relationship with his mother was very distant and very indifferent in some ways on Holbrook's part. He really wanted nothing to do with her and never talked about his family, never. It was as if he was raised himself. Long-time friends didn't know that he had a brother, didn't know that he was Jewish. <laughs> Judy Gell, Les Gell's wife, told me the story of being in their kitchen in 1990 or 91 with Jackie Mason, mm -hmm. who was performing on Broadway. and was at their house for dinner with Holbrook, and Jackie Mason looks at Holbrook and says, are you Jewish? And Holbrook, yes. And Judy Gelb, who'd known him for 25 years, nearly dropped her plane because this had not been part of their, two years later he became ambassador to Germany and realized that he needed not only to say this, but could use it. So he became Jewish. <laughs> at the age of 52, uh, when he became ambassador to Germany. So that's a short version of the, the childhood. Basically, he cut himself off from his past and was always moving onward and upward. It's very hard to get him to, to think they were talking about it. Yes, sir? Did the, the, the anti-war protests go on in America during the war? Did, they, did he reflect on that? Did yeah, that he did. Did. He was at Princeton um, after he left government in 69, and you couldn't miss it. He did not become a pacifist. Tony Lake went further in that direction, not as a pacifist, but just as a skeptic of American power. Holbrook saw Vietnam as a terrible mistake, but he never stopped believing in American leadership. He just thought we needed to be wiser about it because his heroes were the architects of NATO and the United Nations and um, containment. So that was his worldview. He never really stopped being that person despite being a participant and front row observer of our greatest national tragedy after the Civil War. Just one more quick question. Yeah. Did he come down heavy on Lyndon Johnson? I know I was a university war mm. protest at that time, and it always seemed to me that the government was just tone deaf. Didn't have a clue what was going on. Well, I don't think he 
care too much about Johnson. He was a Bobby Kennedy guy, and Bobby Kennedy and Lyndon Johnson hated each other, and so he kind of had to be careful around Johnson, but aligned himself more with Kennedy. He did write a chapter of the Pentagon Papers, the chapter on pacification. He knew Ellsberg very well. Ellsberg tried to get Holbrook to kind of participate in the leaking of the Pentagon Papers. Holbrook wanted nothing to do with that because he wanted to have a future in government. Um, but his chapter is really good because he was such a good writer. He, and yet it's not, he never went where Ellsberg went. He never became a critic of the very basis of American foreign policy. Uh, he became a critic of mistakes along the way and always trying to bring us back to a tough but wise internationalism so that we would be able <coughs> to get involved in problems around the world. I think for him, the problem, what Vietnam did was crippled us and made us unable to project power, and that was, for him, the lasting damage. And it damaged him and his whole generation of Democrats, and he spent most of his career kind of showing that he was a hawk, because what he had to live down was you lost the war for us. That was the, the politics of it. A couple more, yes. So here was this brilliant, maddening, and somewhat threatening person. What do you, do you, did you feel from all of this that was his overriding value that kept people wanting to have him around within that power yeah. network? And also, do you think that the, he broke the mold? Do you think that someone like that could exist now within that same? Network. Yeah, the, to answer the second question first, no. <laughs> Absolutely not. He would be doomed by um, the caution and weakness of his own State Department. He would be doomed by um, the politics of it and by media, by social media. I mean, imagine if every crappy thing Holbrook did that's in my book was tweeted out by people oh, who knew about it. I mean, his reputation would be shredded and he wouldn't really be able to defend himself, even though I think there's a lot to say in his favor. What was the core value? I think the core value was America has a special role to play in preventing evil and doing good in the world. Now that sounds almost religious, and it was not religious with him. It was much more practical. But that was kind of the core of it. And that required us to be able to get things done. And he had no time for bureaucrats who passed their entire career essentially avoiding getting anything done because getting things done gets you into trouble. He did not care about getting into trouble. He liked getting into trouble. And he saw that as the price of getting things done. But always getting things done in the interest of this higher vision of what America represented. It came, I think, from his parents, from his background, um, and from some place that I can't even understand. But it, that, it animated him throughout his life. Yes, in the back. Oh, so I don't know if this is right or not, but I'm getting the impression that this is a man who really didn't learn very much to now. About his, about America and history? About himself and other people and everything. That's true. That's true. I think there's something, one reason why I didn't dig into his childhood is because it, it feels as if it was baked <coughs> from day one. It didn't change. And so that was a problem for me as a writer. You want there to be growth, <laughs> understanding, change, inward recognition, some that's part of the drama of a life story. And with Holbrook, it's not. So it's all externalized. It's all what he's doing. But the inability to see himself and the consequences of that outside on the stage of history, that's a really interesting story. And that's part of the story. But I think you're you're right. He he, he became a better diplomat over time, and he became um, probably a better husband and father over time, with lots of setbacks. But he did not change as a human being. 
and people who knew him said that. What was he like when he was 22? Exactly the way he was when he was 69. <laughs> it's strange, isn't it? You would think someone who lived that much would, would be changed by all those experiences, but it turned out that he was, there was something kind of inflexible about him, his character. Yes? If Captain Martin had not given you the archives, mm. would you have been tempted to write this book about Holbrook? And would you again write about an almost great mm. public figure? Or is it either too challenging or frustrating? I would not have written about him without the papers. I wouldn't have even been tempted because um, those papers were the, the value added. They were the unique advantage to be able to have sole possession of a lifetime's worth of thoughts, diaries, speeches, drafts, letters, was something that doesn't happen very often when it's a figure is big and important. Um, so I, in a way, this was the cart before the horse. I wrote the book because I had the papers. I didn't get the papers because I wanted to write the book. And that's why I had such a hard time getting started and why finding that voice was so crucial because otherwise I'm not sure I would have been able to write the book. Would I do it again? No. <laughs> I'm not a biographer. Um, and I don't think I'm going to get that chance with someone else. And I'm here to tell you that writing about an almost great upper mid-level diplomat in the age of the 24-hour news cycle and Twitter <laughs> is an uphill battle. It's an uphill battle. I'm not sorry I did it, because I'm proud of the book, and I think it's a, a book that stands on its own as a book, as a, as a reading experience. That's what it is above all. That's what I want you to get out of it, is just the experience of being carried along by it. Um, but it's not an easy way to make a living. And I think I'll, I'll be looking for other subjects. Are we done? Yeah. One more? Yes? Do you think Holbrook would have wanted you to be his <laughs> semi-biographer, I guess? Or, or do you think that he said anything to his wife that caused her to choose the No, person? no. <laughs> I think he wanted to be his biographer. <laughs> Those papers which he collected and had someone archive, like he had an archive. That wasn't for after he was dead. That was for when he would write his great man memoirs and he never had a chance. So I think he might have, in the end, been grudgingly okay with it, but so many resentments and denials and who are you to do this? How can, who are you to say anything about me? You don't know, yeah. All of that would have been so hard for him to overcome if he couldn't control it, which I wouldn't have let him. So I, I, it's hard to imagine. I, this could not have been done unless he was, the condition for this book was that he was dead. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Oh, over here, yes. Now, can you say something about his first two wives? His first wife? They both lived near here. In fact, they lived within a block of each other, um, although they didn't know that until his first wife saw his second wife's name under hers on the voting rolls. <laughs> <laughs> the first wife, the mother of his boys, um, Liddy, they met at Brown, that she was um, a really impressive student, impressive person, but like many women of that generation, she subordinated her career, her talents to him, followed him to Saigon, to Paris, to Washington, um, and like many women of that generation, had to remake her life when he walked out in the early 70s, which I kind of think of as the age of divorce. And she did remake her life and became a lawyer and married again and raised the boys and is in every way uh, an impressive woman and was immensely helpful to me in taking me through those 10 years of, of marriage together. The second was a, a flicker. It was a mistake. It was a, it, some people said he married his second wife because Jimmy Carter issued an edict that anyone holding a high position in his 
the administration could not live in sin. <laughs> Do you remember that? It's true. <laughs> so within a couple of weeks, Holbrook, had lust in their heart. Too. <laughs> yes. Yes, Holbrook married the woman for whom he had lust in his heart, and that might not be alone the stateless basis for a marriage, and um, it lasted a year or two, and they went their separate ways. And um, I had an interesting email exchange with her, and she was helpful too. Okay, one more. Okay. Yep. Are you circling in on your next subject? What interests you? Well, I have a big piece in the Atlantic this month. It's out online now. It'll be the cover, and it's kind of the story of how all these institutions that Holbrook cared about, including the State Department, had been crushed by President Trump. Uh, it, yeah, I try to imagine Holbrook as a sort of that maybe the Assistant Secretary of State for Europe, which he was, when Marie Ivanovich was being destroyed by lies and a, camp, a smear campaign, what would Holbrook have done in that situation? Would the bad Holbrook have said, I don't know this woman, she's not that important, um, I'm not gonna get crosswise with the president, or would the good Holbrook have said, this is the foreign service, this is our foreign policy, it's being corrupted by um, ideologues and by a, a president who's pursuing his own self-interest. I think the latter. <coughs> It's hard to imagine Holbrook in the Trump era. I don't think he could, he would have fathomed the Trump era. I don't think he would have known how to begin to oppose it, because it's so alien and, and antithetical to him. But anyway, I'm obsessed with the same things you are, so that's what I'm writing about. <laughs>